When my dad came back from World War II, he came back to Cincinnati, a city that was struggling between its promise and its practice. There were vestiges of segregation, there was a housing shortage, and so he and my mom started our family off in a public housing community called the Laurel Homes. They would sit at their kitchen table and they would ponder the way up the ladder of opportunity. My mom believed in the accelerating power of education. My dad believed in working and saving and working and saving. But what bound them was an unbridled optimism that in Ohio, in America, that if they worked hard, if they saved, if they invested in their boys, their sons could do better. Ken's actually one of my oldest political friends because we were classmates at Xavier from 1966 through 1970. I was student body president at Xavier in our senior year. Ken was president of the Black Student Association on campus. Ken, as I recall, was involved in supporting voting rights, voter registration programs while he was a student on campus. Ken later was very involved in a whole series of voter registration programs, both while he was on campus and particularly off campus, as a lot of us who were involved in politics were. He even talked the Xavier administration into sending Ken and a couple of other of the members of the Black Student Association to Martin Luther King's funeral. And it doesn't surprise me today to look at him and see him in important political leadership positions. What continuously shocks the hell out of me is to see where his political philosophy has gone from frankly being pretty far on the left as a college student and social activist to now having gone very, very far to the right. He started out as a Democrat and I think after the election of Jimmy Carter he, that wasn't real popular so or the loss of Jimmy Carter I think then he became a charterite. When Reagan became popular, he decided to become a, a Republican. So he's gone through the transition of uh, each, you know, and then once he became a Republican, he became a very conservative Republican and went to the base. Man of the hour for this area, and I'm talking about Ken Blackwell, who we need desperately in the United States Congress. You can't count on him. When I said ultimate opportunist, I think that Ken goes whichever way the grass is greener. If he sticks up his fin finger and the wind blows, that's where he is. What pisses you off most? Kim Blackwell. His version of the truth. You asked me what the truth was. I, I'm not sure Kim Blackwell has a definition of truth because his changes from day to day. I think truth is found in some uh, moral absolutes. I think that, that light conquers dark. You talk about his transition of political beliefs there's also apparently been a transition of his religious beliefs. This is a guy who started out as, as a Baptist. He later said that he had converted to Catholicism as a result of his experience with the Jesuits at Xavier. And now he identifies himself as an evangelical Christian. Evangelicals are approximately 30% of the vote, which means they are approximately two and a half to three times as large as the African American bloc. Ohio is such a Christian state, the question in politics isn't if you will try to appeal to the Christian vote, but how much you will pander to the Christian vote. It already appears that who can out Jesus who is gonna be a big issue in the general election. I got a call from a our Secretary of State yesterday, and he said, please know that you're on my heart and mind today. I'm praying for you, Pastor, because I know they're trying to wear you down. Secular left, the media, Hollywood, the academic left, the religious left are doing their dead level best to cripple the body of Christ that still believes that Genesis is in the Bible. For his part, Blackwell had repeated meetings with prominent evangelical pastors, and they loved him. And they had joined with him in getting a uh, gay marriage ban passed in 2004. When it came time to look for a leader, we found one by the name of Ken Blackwell who said, yes, it's the right thing to do. Marriage defined by the Bible as one man and one woman is what God intended, and I'll stand with you. Johnson finished by giving candidate Blackwell what the Ohio Restoration Project calls its Courageous Leadership Award. 
I want you to join me in thanking a leader of leaders, Secretary of State Ken Blackwell. To date, Johnson has held six such rallies throughout Ohio. Blackwell has been the only candidate ever to appear, and at each one, Johnson presented the same award to Blackwell. The strategy of inciting conservative turnout with gay marriage came from Karl Rove, Bush's closest advisor. To the core of his being, uh, Ken Blackwell is pro-life, pro-marriage, conservative, right by reflex. Ken Blackwell is a pro-life, pro-family conservative. Blackwell championed the passage of Ohio's marriage amendment, defining marriage only between a man and a woman. I believe that America has a godly heritage and that we are the great democracy that we are because we have a moral foundation. I believe, as Dr. King believed, that we have a choice. We can choose to be a passive thermometer or the religious can choose to be an active thermostat. I have chosen to encourage religious communities to be active thermostats engaged in righting the wrongs of our, our communities. Kenneth Blackwell, Blackwell, our next governor, yeah. hallelujah. It is barbarically uh, filthy governor. for anybody to practice sex in their anal rectal. God bless America. Welcome to the governor's debate with gubernatorial candidates Ken Blackwell and Ted Strickland. Mr. Strickland. The North American Male Boy Love Association applauded your vote. This was a resolution that was a counterweight to a report that said that there are times when sex between children and adults are positive. This resolution said that that was not the case and condemned adult and child sex. You were one of 13, 355 of your colleagues voted for the resolution. It was voted unanimously in the Senate. While in 04, one of the other advantages that they had in appealing to the right-wing conservative religious base was having on the ballot a ban on gay marriage state constitutional amendment. That's not here this year. And what Ken's done that I found particularly despicable was try to create a gay issue in this campaign. When you had an opportunity to stand up, you sat down and got a standing ovation from the North American Man Boy Love Association. Mr. Blackwell, you're just outrageous. Um, you may know more about the North America Man Boy Free Love Association than I do, but I'm not aware that they applauded my vote. Blackwell comes out with statements that virtually claimed Ted Strickland is gay. The only explanation for it was he was trying to get back to appealing to that right-wing religious base. And that was his desperation, Hail Mary pass, trying to re-energize that base. Ken Blackwell has a successful record of change. Mayor of Cincinnati, increased local lending for job creation. U.S. Ambassador, traveled three continents learning the world economy. State Treasurer, earned record returns for taxpayers. Secretary of State. He's ambitious. We all were. The only injuries we ever sustained is the fight for the camera. <laughs> you know, as we were <laughs> running down for the morning press conference or whatever. We used to laugh about that, but he he knew how to get the camera as, you know, as I did. I, but I never found him to be particularly, you know, dirty or anything like that. He, he loved publicity. He loved, you know, he loved the attention. Ken Blackwell, he's one of the few public officials who, on a public salary, just happened to become a multimillionaire while the state's treasurer getting unexpected loans from banks. There is absolutely more opportunity for an African-American statewide in the Republican Party than there has been for African-American Democrats. He becomes a state treasurer, and uh, there he has the good fortune of him and four friends in the early 90s of pulling $500,000 together. He's an investor with four others without any experience in radio and they borrow money from the Providence Bank, which is hooked a million, uh, connected to uh, billionaire Carl Lidner and, uh, of United Brand fame. For four black guys without any experience in radio, they managed to get five million or so dollars from private banks, and uh, 
And then within uh, six years, that investment of 500000 with the loan from the banks uh, is sold for an estimated $190 million. I remember walking into Mrs. Ida Mae Rhodes' room one time and I said, Mrs. Rhodes, she was my fifth grade teacher. What's the difference between I am rich and I is rich? She said, me. And she said, one day you might be rich, but you will also know how to speak correctly. He's either a tremendous success story or someone uh, who did quite well by being the treasurer of Ohio uh, and parlaying a small investment into a multi-millionaire uh, status that he has today. We have African Americans who are at the richest point in the history of this country. We have some of the richest African Americans in the world right here in the United States of America. And I would have to say that it's been Republican policies pretty much that have led to that growth. If the abolitionists had said, you know, we're not gonna take anybody off of the plantation until we can take everybody off of the plantation. You know, how silly would that have been? George Bush has had four African Americans serving in his cabinet. Bill Clinton was supposed to be the first black president when he only had two African Americans serving in his cabinet. And he didn't do more than what uh, uh, Nixon did, okay? Or what George Bush's father did, or what Reagan did. They really embraced the diversity. But in George Bush, the son's campaign in his, in his cabinet, he has four African Americans that have served as cabinet members. So if Bill Clinton was the first black president, does that make George Bush sole brother number one? The Republican Party has certainly embraced African Americans at a rate that's much better than what the Democratic Party has done. A symbol of this Republican embrace for Blackwell is, is the this conservative, conservative blogger, blogger, the whistleblower. He mocks politicians from his basement outside Cincinnati under the name Charles Foster Kane. You want to watch here, okay. here, and here, and, and this is where we do the whistleblower. And is that G. Gordon Liddy? Yeah. Cool. You talk on the phone, you type on the computers, you look on the internet, and you dream up all these horrible things to say about people, and that's and that's what we do. Uh, <laughs> is that the standard of uh, uh, of journalism? Is that? Oh, well, we we have the lowest possible standards <laughs> to which we try to adhere. We refer to him affectionately as Buckwheat Blackwell. You know, I'm Buckwheat. Remember me? And why do you call him Buckwheat Blackwell? <laughs> because he reminds me of Buckwheat. <laughs> because he's black. Because that's where the joke is. I uh, see. see okay. You gotta see where where is the joke. I see what you're. Uh, okay. This is what you meant when you said you were racist. Oh, wait a minute. How come he wants to have this picture taken with me all the time? Um, no, I'm not. No more racist than the, no. We, I, I. Is that a racist? He doesn't yeah. look very racist. Yeah. Oh, you mean you? Oh, no, oh, okay. it's not a racist. Uh, Come on. Have you ever actually referred to Jay Kenneth as Buckwheat to oh, his face? Oh, always. Oh. Buckwheat! He is as white bread as they come. It was particularly ironic that in the race that he had some years down the road for the United States Congress against Charlie Lucan, both of them being former mayors of Cincinnati, Ken took a position against the extension of the Civil Rights Act, while Charlie supported it. Um, and Ken, by taking that very negative position on an issue that he had been on the opposite side of so frequently and so publicly many other times, really upset many of the leaders in the African American community here in Cincinnati. And in the end, Ken, who had a real opportunity to be elected to the United States Congress, lost the African American community in that election. I would like very much to vote for a black man for to be the first governor for the state of Ohio, but unfortunately, uh, just because a person is black does not necessarily mean that he's for the interests of black people or, or poor folk and the folk that need help. When they become Republican or they jump parties or they become ultra-conservative, I don't see them continuing to advocate for black life. I don't see them continuing to, to be a strong voice for change. But there's something wrong with all, including me, all people who go into politics. You know, what is it? Were they not loved at home? <laughs> Why do you need this, this incredible acceptance by the public?
And um, so I think he's, you know, tends to be a little bit of a showman, but they all do. We, we all do. There's nothing I could say about him that wouldn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. Except? Except I'm right on the issues and he's wrong. Except no. that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would be very concerned about Ken in the role of governor of Ohio because of the far right wing positions that he has taken. I'd be very concerned about what it would do to a whole range of social programs around the state. I'd be very concerned about what it would do to women's rights in the state of Ohio. I have been very concerned and, and upset with some of the positions he's taken on voters' rights in the state of Ohio. And yeah, Ken can argue that he's won every lawsuit in the end that was brought against him, especially in 2004. And that's true. He typically lost all of those cases when they were at the Court of Appeals level, and then by the time they got up to the Republican dominated Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, he won up there every time. But positions he took as the Secretary of State that limited people's right to vote and that really took the ballot away from thousands of people in the state of Ohio in the last presidential election go in exactly the opposite direction of the kind of person who I always thought Ken Blackwell was. We're waiting for the great train wreck in Ohio. In 2006, I think, Ken Blackwell is not going to lose any election where he counts the votes. All of the pundits, all of the left-wing, you know, activists had Ohio in Kerry's column. The president was down by 9 or 11 points in many of the polls. On election day, you deliver. The Associated Press has now projected Ted Strickland as the governor-elect for the state of Ohio. It's all right to cry. Crying gets the sad out of you. It's all and suddenly, right after never getting close to Blackwell this whole campaign, I could suddenly walk into his party off the street. I've called Congressman Strickland and congratulated him and extended my best wishes. I say to you this evening, in the midst of a political setback, to God be the glory. It's all right to cry, little boy. I know some big boys that cry, too. When he ran for governor, totally misread where America was, where Ohio was, and I think his party paid a price. I, you know, I, I'm not sure they'll forgive him in a hurry. You know, I don't see any. I mean, I think politically, you know, he may get some somewhere, some type of appointment, or he'll probably go into the private sector. But I think politically, it's pretty much over. <laughs>